Welcome to Mix Understood, where we explore identity, the meaning of the word race, and talk about the multicultural and multiracial experience with stories from our own lives. I'm Hannah Lee. And I'm Amy. And today we have a very special episode. So far in the series, we've been tackling current dilemmas of mixed actors in the industry, but we wouldn't be doing this series justice without taking a look into the past. So in today's episode, we are going to be going back to the glamorous golden era of Hollywood. We'll be taking a deep dive into what it was like to be a multiracial and multicultural actor during those times. Today, we're going to be focusing on two incredible film icons, Mel Oberon and Rita Hayworth. And next week, we're going to be sharing stories of the groundbreaking and bold stars that are Lena Horne and Freddie Washington. She's making her way in Hollywood and building her career all while going through this extensive makeover that's essentially eliminating most traces of her ethnicity. And they said to me, would you like bleach on your face? literally use that word bleach on your face and I was like no no thank you before we dive into this episode it's important to say that we're here to offer up stories ideas and various theories for you to consider and decide for yourself in light of your own knowledge and experience we hope to explore learn and grow together with you we're not professing to have any of the answers our aim is to start conversations around these topics So, we're going to start off with Mel Oberon. I hadn't heard about her before we started researching for our podcast. Neither had I. And I was honestly so excited to learn about her because, you know, when you learn about someone who is a very similar mix to yourself, and it's like, oh, someone who was a similar mix to me existed in like the 1920s, 1930s, and she had this whole story where... You know, she lived in India, she lived in England, and then she ended up in Los Angeles. And like, you know, there's just like stuff that you relate to. And um, yeah, it's just really exciting to find out about these women. Okay, so Meryl Oberon, an Oscar nominated actress and probably best known for playing Kathy opposite Laurence Olivier's Heathcliff in the 1939 classic Wuthering Heights, spent her life hiding her biracial identity passing for white. She was born Estelle Merle O'Brien Thompson in Mumbai, known then as Bombay in 1911. So her mother is believed to be of Sri Lankan and Maori ancestry. And her father, Arthur Thompson, was apparently a British mechanical engineer. Just before I go any further, I have looked at a lot of different articles and some of them say different things. I mean, for example, some of them say that her father was Australian. Some people say that he was British. That doesn't really affect this story, but there are a lot of things that aren't consistent. I just want to say that before I carry on. (laughs) So Meryl was given birth to by a 12-year-old girl Mm. called Constance. Yeah. I read somewhere that her mother... Meryl's mother was actually raped by her stepfather. Mm -hmm. Exactly. An article in The Guardian states that in an attempt to soften Oberon's lot in life, her grandmother raised her as her own and convinced her that her teenage mother was in fact her Mm. half-sister. So I don't really know if during Mel Oberon's life, if she ever found out that actually her older sister was her mother Wow. I'm not really sure. Can you imagine that? I cannot imagine it. Going through life thinking that your mother is your sister. Yeah. First of all, the mother must have been in utter trauma and shock mm-hmm. from what happened to her. Yeah. A, the rape, and then B, becoming a mother when you're still a kid. Yeah. I mean, think about how your life looked when you were 12. I was in seventh grade. Yeah. You've literally just started your period. Yeah. If that. Yeah. You know? And- Not only does she have to give birth, which is like, oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. at that age. And then she's a mom. And then immediately told that now this baby is going to be her sister. Like, yeah, this is how we're going to handle it. No, I know. And there was so much that 
the family felt that they needed to hide because not only that, but so that same Guardian article mentions that this is the, basically the context that she was born into as well. After centuries of intermixing, babies born from biracial relationships had evolved into a quiet shame, shunned by Britons and Indians alike. So, it, you know, it was just shame upon shame mm. that they were hiding. Yeah. So you were conceived by rape, but also you're mixed. Yeah. There was no space for mixed people back then. No. You had to be one or the other. And I think according to some of the reports and articles that I read, she started using um, skin lightening cream from quite an early age, from adolescence, apparently. So although I think her skin was light in probably in comparison to her mum, to her biological mother, she still used all these skin lightening creams, which, by the way, people used when I lived there. I see it here, too. Like there's all these... Um facial scrubs and whatever and it's they call it skin brightening yeah I, I actually had to um endorse a skin brightening cream and you know it's, it's a whole I don't know if it's exactly the same now but all the big Bollywood celebrities are endorsing in the face of you know these skin lightening creams I remember going for a facial in Mumbai and they said to me would you like bleach on your face literally use that word bleach on your face and I was like no no thank you like just casually like in a restaurant like uh do you want something to drink with that pasta yeah bleach, want some bleach? bleach. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm good I'm good on the bleach <laughs> thanks oh my god but honestly it's it's the mentality and it's it, it's really ingrained over there that you know lighter skin is better yeah not just there everywhere well, yeah 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 so, um, so, okay, so she was born in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. How does she become an actress? How does she? Yeah. So at the age of 17, I don't know if it's just her or the whole family moved to London and she's doing some like background parts and working as a dancer in a club and then meets this English director called Alexander Corder who happens to also be the first of her four husbands, mm. who cast her in a small but pivotal role as Anne Boleyn in The Private Life of Henry VIII in 1933. The film, I don't know if, if they thought this would happen, but it basically catapulted her into leading lady status. It was the start of her rise to fame because she went on later in life. She goes on to do the, all these films, including The Scarlet Pimpernel, The Dark Angel, for which she was Oscar nominated. Wow. Yeah. Um, at the same time, Catherine Hepburn was also a nominee as well. So this goes mm. to show what a big deal she really was. And then later um, she starred in Desiree opposite Marlon Brando. Wow. But because of this sudden catapulting into the limelight, they had to quickly come up with a story about where Merle was from, like what her background was, because they couldn't say that she was mixed. Mm. Yeah. And people are getting more and more curious about, I mean, mm -hmm. back then until this day, it's like, well, if you're a celebrity, that means the public has access to your private life and we want to know it all. Yeah. Want to know where you're from, everything. Yeah. And apparently it was... Um, her first husband, Alexander Corder, the one that came up with this story. Okay. So the story, Interesting. That, the story that he concocted, yeah, was that Merle was born in Tasmania. And apparently the reason why they said that was according to Murray Delovsky, who's actually the director of the 2002 documentary, The Trouble with Merle. She said they said Tasmania because it was so far from the US and Europe and generally considered to be British to its core. Then maybe they just thought that nobody would, would ask any questions because it was so far away. <laughs> <laughs> so, so somebody would come up to, to them and be like, so where are you from? And she'd go, Tasmania, and then silence. That's it. No more <laughs> questions. Okay, cool. I don't know anything about that place. Um, yeah. That's like when. So, people... do you want any bleach? No. <laughs> That's like when people describe their job to me, like if it's a really technical job. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I literally have nothing. I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah. So, going back to the concocted story. So, one number one, they said that she was born in Tasmania. Number two, they said that her birth records had been destroyed in a fire. So, poof, they've disappeared. And then, then they also presented 
Merle's biological mother, Constance, as the maid because she had darker wow. skin. They were able to do that. Yeah. Mm. They're like, okay, the sister thing worked in Mumbai, but over here in the UK, it's a little bit weird that their skin color is so different. Let's let's turn her into the maid. Mm-hmm. So yet another trauma for the for her mother, Constance. Yeah. Her life was just ruined and then now like the best she can be is is a maid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the things that she did because basically her nephew, her nephew that she had when she was with Michael Corder wanted to at one point write a biography and sort of come out with this secret that he said wasn't a secret in the inner circles but she said if you do that I will see you and cut you out of the will so her step nephew yeah on her husband's side is like man I'm fascinated by your life story and you're this big star and I I want to write a biography about you and she's like Pulls out the gun. She's like, not if you want to live. Yeah. (laughs) No, you will not. Yeah. Let me rein you back in. But yeah, because if they would expose her, that would be the the end of her career. Yeah. And she would be shunned by society. Yeah. And that's another thing I want to talk about. Why did she do this? Because, uh, so here it's like, let's just give a bit of context as to what the hell was going on in Hollywood at the time for people to feel like they couldn't say who they really were and hide their identity. Hollywood at the time had rules about showing interracial relationships on screen. The Guardian article that I've been referencing says, rather than leave it up to lawmakers, Hollywood seized on the opportunity to police itself, adopting a set of rules known as the Hayes Code, which, among many other things, frowned upon interracial romance. The Huffington Post says, in the 1930s, Hollywood's strict set of moral guidelines called the Hayes Code forbade the depiction of interracial love in film. So they weren't allowed to show the mixing of races. Like this was Mm. seen as being not correct, not right, something to be ashamed of. So there was this mentality that was the messaging. And so she had no choice but to hide her identity. And she's also got these men in her life, probably pressurizing her, telling her that, I don't know, maybe I'm just making this up, but I can imagine saying, you know, you can't possibly say the truth. You've got to make something up. Mm. So basically, it's not that people of color were not allowed to be on screen, but someone of her caliber who was already playing lead roles and going up for Oscars usually the lead has a love interest in the film. That's just how it works. It's the smaller roles that don't get like a a love story in the script usually. So yeah, it's not that she wouldn't have been able to continue to act, but that she would have had to take a step down to do smaller roles that don't have a romantic interest. Yeah, but even then it probably would have presented problems because it's like, well, you're too light to play a quote-unquote South Asian person, but you're too... Maybe you're too dark to play, or we we now know that you've got that you are of South Asian descent, so therefore you can't possibly play a white passing person because we know. Yeah, yeah. Now we know. Yeah. So these were the circumstances in which she was she was living in, and the landscape of Hollywood. What a isolated life, you know. Because yeah. it's one thing that you're hiding your true identity from the world. It's another thing that even within your close family you're isolated because you don't even know Mm. if who your mother is and you think that your grandmother is your mother but I'm sure a part of her felt like something is off who knows what sort of mental and emotional issues her mother had as well and and even it's so traumatizing to be like you're my sister but now we're gonna make you the maid I know her sister quote-unquote would reveal that she's mixed. Yeah. A lot of what I've read, it's almost as if she comes across quite cutthroat. Like, I will do anything to conceal my identity and I don't care about anything other than my career. Like, this is just from the information that I've been absorbing Mm -hmm. over the last few days. But it must have been completely traumatizing. She must have felt so much inside. 
dealing with all of this. Yeah, because whether she knew her mother was her sister or not, that is awful to turn your sister into the maid Mm -hmm. to protect your own identity. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking of of my sisters. Like, there's no way in a... I mean, I'd like to think. Again, I didn't live in that time, but it just goes to show, like, the survival. I'm sure that her success, that, that the whole family was leaning on it as well. Like, they needed her success for... Yeah. financial security, you know, um, so there were, there were benefits going the other way as well. Also, I, I just think it's interesting that there hasn't been really any work about her. There was one project where the character was kind of based on her. Um, it was called The Last Tycoon and Jennifer Beale's character, you know, the woman from Flashdance, she, mm-hmm. she played a character called Margot Taft who is based on Mal Oberon. And so it was It was a TV series. It ran for one season, but then it was cancelled. But I just think, my God, what an interesting woman. What, an, what a life. Yeah. And another thing that's interesting <laughs> is that she had a car accident later in her career. And apparently that and a combination of her use of skin lightening um, creams made it so that there were there were scars on her face mm-hmm. and this cinematographer called Lucien Ballard developed a special camera light to help her hide her facial scars and she ended up marrying him mm. yeah and then another thing and I will finish on this <laughs> so you know how Michelle Yeoh won best actress yeah won the Oscar for best actress for everything everywhere all at once in 2023 but had Mel Oberon identified her dual heritage and acknowledged her South Asian roots, many argue that she would have been the first Asian actress to have been nominated for an Oscar. Mm. That just gave me chills. Yeah, I just thought it's a fascinating story. So sad. I feel so sad. I wish we could pick up the phone and call her. I know. And she was such a huge deal. I mean, she was in the original... She was the original Kathy opposite Heathcliff. What a film. Mm. No, I, I went into a rabbit hole the other night on YouTube when I was um, just looking at their scenes from Wuthering Heights mm. and then looking at the more up-to-date film with Juliet Binoche mm. and then go, going further down a rabbit hole by looking at Kate Bush's song. Oh my God, what was it called? Hang on one sec. How does it go? It's me, I'm Kathy. <laughs> we discovered Amy and I maybe a year ago. It wasn't both... that long ago. This year feels like it it's been about five this years. Year? <laughs> was when Aurora was a yeah. baby, I think. We discovered that we're both huge Kate Bush fans. <laughs> we had a Kate Bush dance party in, in your kitchen. We did. We should have another one. Yes. I know. She's so amazing. <laughs> wow. Meryl Oberon, rest in peace. Yeah. I, I feel kind of guilty that I feel bad for her that the truth did come out, mm-hmm. you know, because she fought so hard that it that it wouldn't. She did. She did. Um, I wonder how how did they discover? Like, how did they find out her true identity after she passed? I think her half brother came across um, the birth records in oh. Bombay and then they actually became public. They became public not that long ago. But I, I'm glad that it has been, that the information has been released because I think it's important for us to understand history and to understand what it was like that yeah, someone felt yeah. that they had to hide their true identity and to, to mm-hmm. see, you know, how far we've come or maybe not come in some people's eyes. Shall we move on to... Rita Hayworth? Mm -hmm. All right, let's just dive in. So Rita Hayworth was an American actress, dancer, and producer who was a huge star. I know you've heard of her. I have. And she was also the ultimate femme fatale or sex symbol of the 1940s. She was a top pinup girl for the soldiers during World War II. And also over her career, 
which spanned 37 years. She appeared in no less than 61 films. Among them, she was famous for uh, Gilda, You Were Never Lovelier, and Separate Tables. And everyone kept saying how she lit up the screen with her sensual beauty. You know, she was recognized by her trademark red hair Mm -hmm. um, and also her incredible dance abilities. In fact, Fred Astaire said that she was his favorite dance partner. Mm. While she was performing, she had this like joyous, carefree kind of energy. But all of that was really, you know, a front for her endless search for love and Mm. I would say acceptance for who she truly was. You know, because her whole life, she was subjected to other people's definition of her. Other people were controlling how she presented and and how she looked. And it didn't matter how much she tried to claim her own identity. She was never quite able to to break free. What was her background? So let's go back to the start. Um, Okay, so... She was born in Brooklyn, New York, as Margarita Carmen Cancino. Her father was an immigrant from Spain, and her mother was American-born of Irish and English descent. And initially, when I started learning about her, I got really jealous because I was like, oh my gosh, she came from this family of dancers and performers. Like, what a dream. You know, her grandfather on her father's side was a renowned classical Spanish dancer who actually popularized the bolero. Mm. And he had a world famous dance school in Madrid. Her grandfather married a dancer as well. Mm -hmm. Then they had seven kids. All of them were dancers. One of them was her father, of course. Mm -hmm. Rita's mother was also a dancer and vaudevillian and a performer and a showgirl on Broadway. Mm. So, I mean, just dance (laughs) coming out of her pores. Everywhere. Yeah. I love that you say that you were jealous while you were reading this. (laughs) Jealous, yeah. so cool that you're so honest about that. Yeah. No, but don't you feel that way as a dancer? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> just want everyone around you to be dancers, <laughs> you know. It's such a privilege, I feel like, to be a dancer. I know. It's rare. Like, I mean, imagine if you had a parent. I know a lot of people that have parent dancers feel that pressure, mm. you know, to be a good dancer or to follow their lead, their mm-hmm. footsteps, literally. Um, but I don't know. Don't you feel like there is that little bit of that fantasy of like, oh, if my parent was a dancer, I would have grown up in the dance studio. I would have had access, 24-7 access to a dance studio because dance classes are expensive. They are. They're really expensive. I know what you mean. I think maybe I don't feel it quite in the same way, but I can totally understand how your imagination just takes off about what it would be like. Yeah, because you get to see, you would have been able to seep yourself in dance. Yeah, I feel like it's so hard to get that training. Mm you know, and pay for it. And then if, but if you have it just right there in your home, it's, it's incredible. Not to go on about myself, but in a way that I could relate is. Go on. (laughs) Well, (laughs) my family are very musical. So I have grown up with that. And I, and I Mm. realized that I'm actually really lucky to have that, but I've definitely taken it for granted because it just was my life. Like there was always music practices and like someone playing the guitar and the violin and like Irish country music and Scottish country music in my household being played live. And so, but yeah, just completely, that was just my life and I've never really thought about it. I think it's amazing that you grew up with all that music around you. Yeah, I, I just think growing up in an artistic household is so incredible. Yeah, I think so as well. I, I, I think it definitely seeps into your blood. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm really grateful that my parents were so supportive of my dancing yeah. and, and they be- believed in my abilities and they, you know, they came to every show. My mom was always there Aww. every show. Even if I was dancing in the mall, <laughs> that's so sweet. <laughs> she would be there. Yeah. Front and center, smiling. Aww. So proud. Yeah, mine too. Yeah. With the video camera. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's always so embarrassing at the time. But yeah, it's so sweet. Speaking of like being mixed, you know, because my mom is white, 
uh, she would always have to turn to the person next to her and and point at me and go, that's my daughter. That's my daughter. Yeah. And I bet they thought like, okay, lady, <laughs> you, <laughs> you do you, you do you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's sad anyway. that there is truth to that though. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, okay. So back to Rita. So you know, again, to me, I'm I'm reading her story. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what a dream. But sadly, it wasn't the case for Rita. Um, she, she started, she actually, her grandfather, her professional dancer grandfather gave her her first dance lesson. And then she would continue to take classes at Carnegie Freakin' Hall in New York mm-hmm. uh, from her uncle. You know, when I lived in New York, I used to take ballet classes like around the corner from Carnegie Hall at City Center. Yeah. And, you know, Carnegie Hall, I remember like living in New York and just it's like the city is so incredible and there's has so much to offer. And and again, that thought of like, man, if what would it have been like to grow up here mm-hmm. to have access to these facilities at a younger age? But, you know, for for Rita... So in my family, when I started to dance, I kind of, I gave the dance bug to my younger brother and sister Mm -hmm. who started to dance after me. But I mean, I've never heard of a family having seven kids and all seven are dancers. So I could feel that probably there was like a pressure to be a dancer in that family. You know, it wasn't really an option. Mm -hmm. And there's a quote here from Rita who said, I didn't like it very much. But I didn't have the courage to tell my father, so I began taking the lessons. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. That was my girlhood. Later, like, when a neighbor would kind of say that she would see Rita was, like, would be rigorously rehearsing with her father and, like, he was really strict with her. And it makes me really sad because dance is really such a joyous thing. I mean, you do need a lot of discipline to become a dancer. That is part of it. But it's so tough when, like, your parent figure is, like, not giving you an option. It's like, Mm -hmm. it's a chore. Yeah, that is so sad when something you love that brings you so much joy becomes something that you maybe start resenting. or But that you're even introduced to it in a resentful Mm. way when you're a young kid. Um, So anyway, she's thrown into show business because, of course, she comes from this family of dancers. Her mother's already on Broadway. They're living in New York City. That's the only language they speak. And before her fifth birthday, she was already dancing on Broadway. Oh, my God. So she grew up in the spotlight. She, She didn't know anything else. And then in 1927, her dad decides to move the family to Hollywood because he kind of had this vision and idea that like dance was going to be featured in in the movies a lot which is kind of cool but i think with the with the depression and everything he also opened a dance studio but maybe things weren't going as well as he'd hoped and so he basically decided to partner with Rita his 12-year-old daughter and that is the beginning of her image being constructed so They decided that they were going to dye her hair from brown to black in order to give her a more, because she's just 12, but they wanted to give her a more mature and Latin look. When you say partner, what do you mean? Like, So he was like doing dance performances with her. Um, And because obviously under the law in California and probably everywhere, she was too young to be performing like her dad was taking her to nightclubs and bars and everything and she was too young to be doing that kind of work Mm. um so they wanted her to look older and they also I mean they were doing like different Spanish dancing and stuff so they wanted her to like have this like more mature Mm -hmm. look and her father was even taking her like across the border to Tijuana you know to do shows there and everything and because she was basically kind of forced to do that help the family make a living she never even graduated from high school Mm. Um, she only completed the ninth grade and unfortunately also I found out that um, her father was a drunk and he was abusive not only physically but also sexually 
to have to dance in that way. You know what I mean? I know. With with your father who is doing that. Oh my goodness. I know. When I reached that part, I literally just had to like stop and walk away from yeah. the computer because I got so sad. You know. That's just awful. So sick. So sick. And again, because they started it off so young and they never gave her an opportunity to grow up into her own self, you know, from a young age, she was already, they were like, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be dancing. You're going to be performing, you know? Um, and then she hits the age of 12 and they're like, okay, and now you're going to be making money off of this. You're going to be dancing with your dad who's sick. But she ends up being discovered in one of the nightclubs. Um, she's discovered by the head of Fox Film Corporation. And he quickly arranges for Rita to do a screen test a week later. And he's impressed. He's impressed by her persona. Um, so they sign her to a six-month contract under Fox. But they decide that they're going to shorten her name from Margarita mm. to Rita. Then they scratch the Carmen and they kept the Cancino. So her name for the first time is changed now. So her hair was changed. Now her name was changed to Rita Cancino. Mm -hmm. And then during that time, she starts to appear in like small roles as like the exotic foreigner. So they had her like as an Egyptian girl, as a Russian dancer. They're just like giving her all the foreign mm -hmm. roles. And then after... That six-month contract, Fox merges into 20th Century Fox, and they're, the new producers there weren't as interested in her. But at that point, she had already met a salesman and PR guy who was called Edward C. Johnson, who also became her first of five husbands. Oh, wow. Okay. And he was able to get the attention of Columbia Pictures, um, of the studio head there, who ended up signing her to a seven-year contract. And the studio head of Columbia, his last name was Khan, was saying like, you know what? Her image is just like way too Mediterranean. And he was like, and you know what? Her last name, it just sounds too Spanish. Why don't we? So then Judson or her husband is like, kind of like um, with Merle's mm. husband. He's like, okay, I got a plan. I got mm. an idea. And he's like, why don't we? Uh, dye her hair red and why don't we change her name uh, so that she takes her mother's maiden name Hayworth so now they just keep the Rita and the Hayworth okay. and you know because now she has this like Irish American name like she could now be regarded as this classic American mm. it is interesting how the the men sort of get involved to concoct this new yeah, right? new branding, new story, yeah. Yeah, first it's her dad, and then it's these two men. And not only did they change her hair color, they also had her do electrolysis to raise her hairline and broaden the appearance of her forehead. Why? Which was a very painful procedure. Again, to make her look more white oh. because she had like a lower hairline. So they literally changed... Her face. God, the, the lengths that these women go to. Yeah, so basically, she's making her way in Hollywood and building her career all while going through this extensive makeover that's essentially eliminating most traces of her ethnicity. Yeah. But the craziest part is that contrary to Meryl, her makeover was not kept secret. Her public transformation was actually what made her so appealing. Oh. So the studios were were highlighting the diets and the painful treatments to her hairline and her name change. Really? So that was like all public knowledge? It was all public, basically saying like, yeah, she's not perfect, but look what we're doing to her. <laughs> look at this. We're transforming her into the ideal. Yeah. Wow. Mm. This is a sad story. Yeah, I know. It's it's really sad. In uh, the Daily J Store 
Org. I'm just going to read what they said here. She was cast as someone who was worth years of investment and work, whose ambition propelled her past what Hollywood considered her, quote unquote, faults, and who, despite being completely manufactured, somehow still retained a genuine appeal. This paradox persists to the day. We want to know that stars, despite their fame and fortune, really are just like us. But her stardom came due to her wholesomeness and sex appeal. Hayworth was idolized both as a white body and as an ethnic one who could play a myriad of interchangeably foreign film roles. Similarly, Hayworth played roles that were both sexy and wholesome, presumably some kind of combination of the permissiveness Hollywood felt her ethnicity allowed and her new identity as a chaste white woman to be protected and cherished. So Hollywood was like, hmm, kind of taking advantage of some of the ethnic things about her, but they were like, but let's repackage it under the umbrella of the white male gaze. Mm -hmm. Let's keep the, the sexiness. We like that. Let's combine it with like the white housewife and boom. Yeah, it's like, let's add these ingredients together and then... We've got a fantasy going. Adrian L. McLean, who was a writer on studio era Hollywood and stardom, and she's a professor of film studies at the University of Texas, Dallas, wrote how basically... You know, again, instead of like hiding it, they actually the studios put pictures of uh, Cancino, Margarita Carmen Cancino, the Hispanic before alongside the after of Hayworth, the perfectly groomed star. That's crazy. They were proud of it. They were proud of how they transformed her. That's so sick. It's so sick. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to comprehend what you're saying. Like, yeah, I know. It's it's shocking. It's listen. It's still constantly happening, right? Celebrities are being told like, you need to have an image. You need to have a a look. Yeah, a brand. You know, your body needs to be like this. You need to. Oh, I definitely. think times are changing a little bit because we're becoming a little bit more casual with like, you know, Zoom and. And the, I think the pandemic changed mm -hmm. a lot of things, too. Um, like, I don't think celebrities are required to be as glamorous anymore as they were before. No, I don't think so. And it's almost like cool to be yourself and to show yeah. real things that people like that, especially, I think, in the world of social media and the fact that we're, we've all got our own yeah. cameras now. We've, we're all able to say what we want to say. Um, but carry on. They, they were saying that, like, the one place that her like Latina identity, which she identified with strongly, actually uh, continued to shine through was was in her mm. dancing. But again, that was also part of the appeal because they were like, well, here's this white looking person with a new hairline that's dancing in a manner that was seen as like sexual or ethnic, you know? Yeah, there was this... Uh, crazy story that happened that while Gilda, like she's like at the height of her fame and Gilda was released and suddenly they, uh, it was reported that an atomic bomb that was scheduled to be tested in the Pacific Ocean's Marshall Island would bear an image of Hayworth on it, kind of saying like, let's put the bombshell oh. on the bomb. <sighs> and it was supposedly like a compliment, like, oh, she's the hottest. Mm. She is the most explosive mm -hmm. bomb. So let's put her on the most explosive bomb. And it was said that like Hayworth was like so offended and hurt and angry. But her husband was like, calm down, calm down. Like, you know, it's supposed to be a compliment. Um, and uh, in an interview with biographer Barbara Leeming, uh, he said, Rita used to fly into terrible rages all the time, but the angriest was when she found out that they'd put her on an atom bomb. Rita almost went insane. She was so angry. She wanted to go to Washington to hold a press conference. But Harry Kahn, who was the, the Columbia uh, head, wouldn't let her because it would be unpatriotic. 
I just think no wonder she was so angry just out of all this control her whole life and complete invalidation. They think it's funny and entertaining to like associate her with like a weapon of mass destruction. (sighs) Yeah. Rita. Anyway, I'll just end. She did have um, a lot of drinking, you know, addiction Mm -hmm. problems, of course. Wouldn't blame her one bit. And then she ended up passing away from Alzheimer's, which was undiagnosed for many Mm. years. And yeah, I just, oh, I felt so, just so sad. Mm. Um, She was never, ever from day one given the opportunity to be herself. Yeah. She was taught that not only does she need to be changed, but she needs to be changed by others. And just always being under the control of somebody else. Yeah, and people were allowed to take advantage of her different sides and aspects and reconfigure them. Yeah, in the way that they thought was best for good marketing and stuff. Yeah, and the contrast between like, huh, let's put her sexy photo on a bomb to like this frightened little girl who was abused Mm -hmm. left, right, and center. And the the world is clueless. Mm Mm-hmm. This is a quote from her. I always thought that if I ever got good reviews, I'd be happy. It's so empty. It's never what I wanted, ever. All I wanted was just what everybody else wants, you know, to be loved. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it even just gives you that empty feeling just hearing that. Yeah. Rita Hayworth. People, from what I read, always said she was the sweetest, gentlest, so yeah. kind, sweet. Yeah, I feel like you and I are so privileged. I mean, we've had our share of struggles in the entertainment industry, but it all pales in comparison to these stories. I know. It really does. To be living in this day and age where you do have the freedom to just be who you are you know yes there are prejudices and yes there are you know there's certain like underlying messages and stuff like that but it it is more underlying it's not overt it's not it's not the law (laughs) yeah it's not the law it's not the mentality it's not the rules there are no there's no haste code or anything like that but it is just so interesting to look at these women you know one who's biracial one who's multicultural and the things that they had to go through because they didn't fit a box. It's also, I mean, this is a little bit off topic, but like you basically couldn't be a successful actress back then without giving sexual services to studio heads. And, you know, that was just part of the deal. You want to be a star, you need to sleep with this, this and this and this and this. Her husband was like pimping her out right and left in order to promote her career it's like what women had to it was one thing to be mixed it was another thing to be a woman back then you know yeah I can't imagine how how hard it would have been I mean obviously we it's still I mean we're dealing with the remnants of me too and and it's yeah but times have changed and uh people are finally being punished and being held accountable yeah at least there's an example of what will happen if you carry on like that like Harvey Weinstein what happened to him at least there is an example now yeah and that was very recent what was that 2018 it was so recent you know there are there are so many things that I could go into about things that I heard when I was living in India and I keep going back to that because it is a bit more old-fashioned than it is here I know that's a sweeping statement but having been in that industry You know, it is not as fast moving and progressive as it is here. Mm. Seriously. I think it's so incredible that we're able to do this podcast and talk about all these people and share their stories and talk about all these things that are uncomfortable. You know, uh, we don't have to apologize anymore. And I think it really does provide context for what we've been doing over the last few weeks, chatting to mixed actors who are working in the the industry now. It just kind of, it just shows you 
what happened before and what's gone on in, in years gone by. You know, another thing is the talent that she had just in her blood. Mm. If she was born and raised in these times, in our times, like she would have been a star regardless of what she looked like or, or her hairline or whatever, just because of her talent and grit and hard work. I wish they'd had the chance to to see their abilities and their gifts. Yeah, and also to be able to harness all of who they were to bring to their performances as well. Like I, I just can't, I can't yeah. even fathom what it would have been like to have to deny part of who you are and your upbringing and so many things that Mel Oberon had to conceal throughout her entire lifetime it must have caused her so much angst and stress and I hope there is a work that emerges about the the human aspect of what she went through rather than just sort of going on about her career yeah okay uh well sending them a big warm hug yeah to both of these beautiful ladies from the inside Mm -hmm. beautiful from the inside um all right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. If you liked this episode, please share it. Please subscribe. Please uh, rate us. Please leave us a review. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it all helps us so, so much. And also, if you want to add anything to the conversation of what we've been talking about, these two amazing icons you know if you want to share maybe something that you've read or a resource that you think we might be interested in please write to us our email address is in the show notes we're going to be listing links to all the resources we used for today's episode and also we might have a few listeners with us today if you're new welcome thank you for being here um we want to give a massive shout out and thank you to apple podcasts Yes, thank you so much, Apple, for featuring us on their digital storefront this week. Um, We are so excited. We really, really appreciate the support. It's really encouraging for us because we've been working so hard um, and we're extremely passionate about what we're doing. And on that note, I guess we are going to say goodbye. Thank you again. And we will see you next week. See you next week. This episode was produced by us. Music by Matthias Kunzli.